Well, thanks for joining me. We've been talking to a number of different people who grew up in communist and socialist countries as part of our Survivors of Socialism series. And uh, today I'm excited to talk to Virika Robinson, who originally comes from uh, Romania, and uh, she came to Canada in the mid 1990s. And so she's going to tell us a little bit about her experience uh, living and uh, growing up in Romania, and then also what her thoughts are about Canada today. So thank you, Virika, for joining me. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So why don't we uh, start at the uh, the beginning? You you grew up in Romania. What was it like growing up under? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Was the Nicolae Ceausescu government? Yeah, was Nicolae Ceausescu. Yeah, I am born in '68, so pretty much all my um, life in Romania was under the communist regime. Yeah, until I left um, Romania at the end of 1992. And, and so communism, it's such a different system from what we know here in Canada. Can you tell us about daily life? Why don't we start off with um, growing up and maybe your access to food, the school system, that kind of thing? Well, I guess growing up is the same like everywhere else, but the society we grew up in, it's quite different. Like if I will compare my growing up and my daughter's it's a big difference. Like I was part of the, you know, um, pioneer, it's called the pioneers, which is like the young generation of, you know, of the communist uh, members, you know, of the party. Mm -hmm. um, you know, school was cool. I walked to school. We were like, sometimes, you know, we didn't even have a lot of, like even shoes sometimes was, you know, a challenge to get, but you see, I didn't know any difference. So that's what it was. But comparing the life my daughter has and I did, it's like big difference, like from here to the moon almost. <laughs> and, and so yeah. you, when we uh, were speaking beforehand, you had mentioned that, for example, food was something that was quite often scarce, hard to get. Could you tell us a little bit, like what was it like if you had to go to the store and get so I think for me, it wasn't too, too bad in the beginning of the communist, as my mom told me and my sister, which is older. But by the time I grew up and I remember, we had to line up sometimes two, three hours before they opened the store. Like they could be a line up for like a mile to wow. get the necessity like bread, sugar, um, oil and other things. Because Ceausescu tried to pay the entire you know, uh, debt that we had. So by, he pretty much starved us to death, some of us, because he was exporting everything we produce in order to make money to pay the debt. Mm -hmm. So it was a difficult time. And I was one of the luckiest because we live in the countryside. So we had a little piece of land around our house and we always have, um, you know, eggs. We always have a little bit of milk from the cow. We had a garden. So we could produce some of our own food, but there are other people in the big cities that they, they go to the store, it wasn't much. And to get the, you know, a loaf of bread or milk or whatever, they had to line up and they had to wait. And sometimes you wait and when your turn comes, they said, sorry, you gotta come tomorrow, we finished. Mm. So that's, you know, that's what I grew up with. So you'd, you'd wait in line for hours and hours. I think some Canadians yeah. can, they can relate to that on Boxing Day. You know, it's, it's not- Probably, a, but it's a different feeling. You know, yeah. you want to buy something, you're excited. It's fine if you don't get it. Maybe tomorrow it's even cheaper. But yeah. for us, sometimes you go and there's no food to put on a table because you didn't make it, yeah. you know, to buy that loaf of bread. So uh, there's no comparison, but I guess, Maybe with the COVID, some of our people, I've seen them line up for the very first time in Canada, right? Yeah. Remember when we had to line up because only certain people in the store. Well, imagine you have to do that from the very early in the morning when you wake up, two, three hours before they open. And then you get there and they say, sorry, we don't have any more. It's finished. So you got to start tomorrow now. Hopefully you go farther, you know, in line, you know, and you make it to get, to get that food you you know, you want to buy yeah it's you know I, I was joking of course it's one thing to do it 
once a year, maybe. And I think most people don't don't line up for hours. And do hours. it daily. Line up, and line up for a bit, but to, to do that on a regular basis and, and to get up super early, it must have been exhausting having to build that into your schedule regularly. Yeah, well, my yeah. mom will send me with my grandma and will stay there, you know, because mom had to take care of, you know, maybe my brother or get ready for going to work or take care of the animals or whatever she had to do. So we try to organize ourselves in a way that we will, you know, um, I was younger, so I didn't have probably much to do. And my grandma was older. She was probably retired. So we could spare the time and line up at three o'clock in the morning to be there at four. You know, not to mention that I never had exotic fruit, right? I don't remember <laughs> when I grew up eating oh. all that. And we never had, except whatever the season we had in making Romania. So, so it took it longer be- to get, your selection was less. What, were these stores, were they, were they run by the state or were they run by private businesses or how did that work no very very few they were in private they were uh, some people let's say you know uh, you're in a small village like I was mm-hmm. and then somebody that wants to you know take care of it. it wasn't a franchise but they will let a family let's say to have a place where they can sell stuff but everything was coming from the government or through mm-hmm. the government channel those people were just employers of, you know, of the, also the government, we didn't really have entrepreneurs. We didn't really have people, they have their own business. I mean, if you are swim stress, yes, you might have your own business, but most of the people will have to still work for, through the government because you need to have a salary. You need to have uh, a pension eventually. And that was all set up. Very few people, like my mom was always a swim stress. So she'll do just little jobs for the neighbors and they'll give us, we exchange services. She will do the dress and my neighbor will give her, I don't know, maybe flower or my neighbor will come and help my mom in the garden for two days for the dress. Right. You know, we did that kind of stuff to help, you yeah. know, um, each other survive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very much like the uh, Marx's idea of controlling the means of production by the state and people would be employed by the state. You get Absolutely. State. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a very, how should I say, they control you really easily because you, you have to go to work to get the money. They, you know, they give you the money. Everything was set up that was easy to control us in absolutely every level. Food, uh, entertainment, everything. There was no choice of, you know, that, okay, I want to open up the cinema and I want to, you know, yeah. play those movies for people you didn't have that it was everything was set up in advance and you have to do according to you did have a choice if you want to go see this movie or the other movie but there were movies the communist party wants to broadcast right yeah so that was your choice well that, that was one of the points that you raised before we we started this conversation it's sort of that lack of choice growing up whether it was food or you also mentioned music too that you couldn't listen to the music that you wanted and if first of all you didn't have access to it was you know very hard because what we had on tvs and on the radios and all that it was always communist propaganda and Mm -hmm. to some degree right and music when i was a student uh, my sister which is older than me said that she was listening to you know beatles or you know um, any other music band or rock and roll I didn't because by the time I was at the age of high school or even university we didn't really have access it wasn't you go to the store and buy the you know buy the record and put it on a lesson so we had those other people that they had them before and pretty much now you have to keep it quiet it was kind of you want to listen we're not going to blast the music up because maybe the police will come and confiscate all our records oh Right. So even our parties, we didn't party very loud. <laughs> if we want to listen, you know, to any rock and roll, we will like kind of, you know, party quiet that we don't lose the music if we have any to listen to. Right. So, yeah, that's it. That's incredible. I think that's very hard for people in, in a country like Canada to relate to because we have so much choice, whether it's music yes. or books or 
or uh, food. Yeah, and it, I see a lot of Canadians, they have a hard time to understand mm -hmm. that it can be possible here. But I should say that I can see it, it's in a lot of ways here. Mm -hmm. Our freedom of choice is more limited every day under different circumstances or different laws that they think will protect that in some way. And, and that, that's what we need to understand. Freedom, it's not a negotiation. You're either free or you're not. Yeah. And so I, I want to come back to that point in a moment to ask you about sort of your observations of, of Canada, but to, uh, to come back to growing up in, in Romania, when it comes to to work, you had you today. You're a financial advisor in Alberta, um, but yeah. you had you were trained uh, petroleum engineer. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, and, and that's so what, my my um, um, education that I achieved on us in Romania. Yes. So what what would that mean if you had have stayed in Romania and worked there? How would your life have been different compared to here in terms of income, the choices that you'd have, uh, so, opportunities. Um, when I left Romania at the end of 92, the communist bloc was gone as per se. So we didn't have, now we, we were, you know, experienced as being a free society. Although I go to Romania after so many years and I still see the society did not advance as it should be because all those years in a communist era, people, have a hard time to be entrepreneurs. People have a hard time now to do something that they're not told because they grew up being told everything, mm -hmm. right? So for me, um, I can only say I do have friends that they remain in Romania and they know all industry and they did really good. And uh, some of them, they even entrepreneurs, right? I don't think they do as good as it's in here, mm -hmm. but I will have to say if, Romania would stay in a communist era yeah. or in a controlled society. I'll have to remember how some of my friends that they graduated before me and they got a job and they work in all industry. Again, everything is controlled. To give you an example, if you wanna be any kind of manager or in a manager position, you have to be in a, communi a, in a communist party. You have to be a member of the party if mm -hmm. you want to advance from an engineering position to being a manager or having any other, you know, um, position in, 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 a, in a company that just the, the basic one. So everything was related to that. And if I would stay there and it, it would be a communist country continue, then I would probably end up having a condo or a small house, maybe even a car, mm -hmm. but I will never experience the life I have here. Yeah. So you because would be there's always a limit, you know, every step yeah. up, it was coming with different, like you have to be in a party, you have to, God knows what I, you know, I, I, I didn't experience that to be able to have a job and be in a communist party in order to be a higher position. I don't know personally, but I know other people that they have to, you know, um, play the game in a way. A lot of the people were just playing the game just to survive and have a better life. And some, they really believed, you know, what the communist party was doing. They were firm believers and mm -hmm. following all the, you know, all the orders. But from my experience, a lot of us, we knew we had to do it because maybe we wouldn't survive but we did not totally believe. That's why I left even after Romania mm -hmm. was in a communist country. I still want to be free in a different way, free to travel, free to buy stuff, to be an entrepreneur, to, you know, to go to the moon if I can, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I needed that freedom to do what I want to without, you know, limiting by somebody else. So if you wanted to get ahead there, you had to be part of the system. You had to be part of the Definitely. government. It wasn't a merit system. If you, in a lot of communist countries, if you, um, when you go to work for the state, in your case, if you had have gone into petroleum engineering there, you would have been paid a, say, a flat amount of money. And you wouldn't have had that system that we have here where you work harder, you're talented, you do really well, you get paid more. You have the flexibility to take on, you know, consulting projects on the side or work extra. Would any of that, 
those is that like is that well that people they the work very hard there too and they're very capable people and they yes. will be maybe they will get a little bit better paid but mm -hmm. to have you see the way they will pay you is by your qualification so you start as an engineer and then you become a chief engineer and then you become a manager or you become you know the the um, manager for the entire region and so on Every single person that will go up, it's not necessarily because it's in the Communist Party, but mm -hmm. they won't be able to achieve that higher level of um, in, in their work if they're not also in a Communist Party. Right. So you very much had to be part of the system. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. some of us, we are forced to be, mm. you know, to keep the job or we have, you know, we, like I said, there was no choice most of the oh. time. And, and so one other point I want to touch on before we talk about sort of your, your decision to leave, when it came to human rights, we talked about how you, you couldn't even choose the music you wanted. But in Canada, I mean, we've seen lots of examples all across the political spectrum where people will hold protests, they'll hold rallies, they'll, uh, you know, you open up the newspaper, you'll see a cartoon depicting a politician mm -hmm. in a not so flattering light. Was any of that allowed? How And if so, how much no. of that was tolerated in, in Romania when you were there? No, you cannot just say, I don't like what the Communist Party does or criticize anybody or their actions in the Communist Party. No, you don't do that. Hmm. If you dare to do that, some of us probably will not make it tomorrow. No, people didn't do that. Yeah, you might have a cartoon, but not picking on a system or on a politician or be something, you know, would also some propaganda you know, be behind that will try to, you know, get you to think in a certain direction. Mm. So no, there, there were some no protests. That's when in 89, when before Ceausescu was killed, there were protests in different parts of Romania and different cities. It started by some students in Brasov and in Cluj. Um, they were beat up by the by the police. They were arrested. Uh, some of them, they were probably killed. I can't remember. This has been over thirty years, but um, no, you you couldn't do that. We all knew. Hmm. Not if you want to risk your life. If you want to, I mean, probably some people did, and they were killed or in jail for, you know, for their lifetime. That, you couldn't I, just go in a truck and protest. No. no. But that's very telling when this the state is so insecure that it can't tolerate any kind of criticism. I want to ask you now about your decision to leave. So you decided to leave. How did that unravel? Were you able to walk out the door or, or, no, or, so, or how did that take place? Yeah. So I graduated in 91. So that's a couple of years after the communist, uh, after Ceausescu was killed and kind of the communist bloc was um um was dissolved um so i wanted to finish my university because i did realize that it will serve me very well coming in any western country to have you know some uh, kind of education mm -hmm. and then when i finished in 91 um by now all the other countries like france germany all the western country they wouldn't let us go without a, a tourist visa mm -hmm. Before it was just you have a passport, you could just go, they open their doors. But now I believe there were such a big influx of all those, you know, Eastern European countries that they're under the communist, everybody wanted to go and see how it's out there. And I was one of them. Yeah. So um, I, I had to leave without having a visa. So pretty much I snuck through the different borders at night or, you know, through cornfields, whatever was not you wow. know, controlled by somebody to make it. I actually, um, we uh, tried a few times. It was actually the second time that, because we got caught, we got back and then try again and so on. And eventually um, we made it to Germany and then from Germany we made it to France. And that's where, that's where I stay in France for a few years until I got um, my immigration paper to Canada. Wow. So you, you went running through cornfields in the middle of the night trying to evade. Yeah. yeah was it scary? Um, a little bit. Yes, I was. I was married at the time with a different uh, gentleman. So I um, we, we left together. Um, yeah. We were in university together. We actually did plan kind of to leave. We knew once we, gonna, we got married when we were in university and then when we finished, 
we knew we want to go somewhere in the Western uh, countries. We didn't know exactly where because we had to apply for a visa and so on, but we knew that we're not going to stay in Romania. Yeah. So I think it was in a way, there were moments that I was kind of scared because I swam a river and then I don't know how to swim, but I had one of those, uh, you know, ding around and my ex-husband, he could uh, swim and he was kind of, you know, keeping me safe. Um, there were times that I was scared, but I remember I was never considering not to make it. Mm. Because I know once we got return, we went back again and back again. And I was determined to make it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you were scared. But when you want something, you know, you fight for it. And I guess that kind of uh, gave me strength, gave us strength. Yeah. Well, you, you say that very casually. I think for a lot of people, that would be a scary thing to be, you know, as you mentioned, you didn't know how to swim, but you're crossing through a, a, a river, you're yeah cornfields i mean that that seems like it'd be a very uh it is but when you when you have that hope and you want something better for yourself um you're not thinking i'm going to be scared you want to get there so your body will just adjust to the situation and you do it and then you see what's going to happen i mean i could very well probably drown i don't know you know i was lucky enough to make it but um my desire to come to a free country to have a life that I can do whatever I want for myself and for my family, my children, that gave me strength. And now, I, you see, at the time when we did it, I didn't know what I'm going through, it was all in on. Now, you know, 20, almost 27 years later that I know what I've been through, I will still do it. Yes. Knowing what I've been through. That's that's how important it was for me to be in a free country. Well, I'm, I'm glad you arrived safe and sound. <laughs> yeah. I want to yeah. switch now. So you've escaped Romania. You're living in Europe for a brief period. You're trying to figure out yes. what you're going to do. And you decided to come to Canada. What was it that made you think, yeah, I'd like to go to Canada. That's a good choice for me. Well, um, I would probably stay in France or somewhere in Europe. But you see, by the time we got there at the end of 92, beginning of 93, I think Europe European countries, they were saturated with immigrants from Eastern European countries like Romania, maybe uh, Poland, Ukraine, Bulgaria, you yeah. know. So every time we apply, they wouldn't take us. They didn't have a system like Canada mm. where you apply and you have experience, you speak the language and so on, right? They didn't take immigrants like Canada. So um, we tried. We couldn't get our paper to stay in France as permanent residents. So eventually we made application to different governments, Australia, uh, South Africa, we did, I think, Canada, I think even United States we apply. I can't remember now, it's been so long, but uh, mm -hmm. Canada was one of the countries that really respond in a matter of few months after we put the application and then we went through the process. And because we were young, uh, I didn't speak any English um and be, but we i speak i spoke french i speak french yeah. so they you know how the system here works it gives you points on age education language and so on and then i think it took from the time we apply to the time we came to canada i think it was around a year or a year and maybe a year and a half wow yeah that's, uh... so that's why here and um I guess it didn't matter any country would take us that was a free country I want to be you know I want to be there. So I, I want to ask you so you you're accepted to Canada you arrive in Canada and maybe you you felt this after you left Romania but um, when Boris Yeltsin was a member of parliament before he was president of Russia there's a famous story about how he was in the United States I believe it was a couple months after the Berlin Wall had fallen and he surprised the people he was touring with by requesting to go to a grocery store, just a random grocery store, visited a random grocery store in Texas. I think it was after he yeah. went to the Space Center and he was amazed. And it was the most <laughs> amazing thing on his trip because he walked in and he couldn't believe the variety, the, yes. the, and the options in that. What, did you have an experience like that? I actually, as a matter of fact, I did. I remember the first time, I think it must have been in Germany because that was the first country we kind of got to um, after we left. Of course, we went through 
first I think we went through uh, Hungary and we want to get to Austria. We couldn't go. We got caught. We sent back. We went back to Romania. And I think the final was through Ukraine, Poland, Poland, Germany. Mm -hmm. But the first time I walked into the grocery store, I could not even comprehend why so much food. Who's eating that much? You know, <laughs> well, I mean, the, I remember the fruit stand. You know, I'm like, uh -huh, uh -huh. like it was an awe. Somebody can have so much food, right? Because I never experienced that before. We didn't have that much food. Uh, sometimes our shelf, they were like almost empty. We could have, except when you go line up and they'll have fresh, you know, fresh bread or whatever we buy. And then that's it. They even closed the store because it was nothing. Nobody will go in to buy what. Um, we got some cans. I think some of that stuff you could find in Romania and the shelves, but never in my entire life until then, I could see so much food. Wow. But I'll tell you a very funny story if you give mm -hmm. me a minute. So sure. I was a student uh, still in university. And after 89, we, uh, the communists broke down, Ceausescu was killed. And now we have kind of food coming in. Now I didn't have bananas probably. I must have had when I was very young when there were still some coming in the country, but I could not remember how they taste. So my ex-husband and I were walking to university from town, I think. I mean, the university campus was at the end of the town kind of. So we must have been to the city center. So we came back and we walked a lot because we didn't have cars. I mean, even the bus was one, whatever. So we walked a lot <laughs> and we're walking and there's this store. They were loading in the store uh, bananas and it was late. I remember it was probably 9 p.m. So mm -hmm. I begged the lady that was in there to sell me some bananas. I was, you know, so desperate. They were very green still. <laughs> Yeah. So I think she sold us some. She was, you know, I said, I cannot even sleep tonight. I, I have to have bananas because huh. <laughs> I didn't even know how they taste. And she sold me, she sold us some and we laughed, but they were still green. And I remember I could not wait a day or a couple of days for them to arrive. <laughs> I ate the green banana. It didn't taste good. Oh, wow. That, you know, I, I, it's, it's for some people, they cannot even comprehend this is possible, but that's how I felt, right? I could not remember how it tastes, the banana, because I never, I must have had some very young, because my, I asked my sister and she said, I brought you some banana when you were little. Maybe I was a toddler. I said, well, I can't remember how they taste. I know how they look, because yeah. I've seen them probably in movies or cartoons, but I want to have a banana. So my ex-husband used to say, why don't you wait? I said, no, I want to have one. I can't wait until tomorrow when they have better. You probably think so. about that story every time you have a banana now, don't you? Uh, maybe not every time, but a lot of the times I a laugh. A lot of times? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you know, now I can have banana every day. And um, I don't know if I should say this, but I do have times. So... When I was in Romania and you asked me, were you scared to leave and what I'd been through? Mm -hmm. I had hope. I had hope I'm going to make it. How? I didn't know. I didn't have a plan. I didn't even, I couldn't plan. I didn't know what was in the other side. Yeah. But now it terrifies me a little bit what's going on in our country and not only in our country, maybe through all over the Western society uh, right now or Western countries. Where do we go from here if we lose this freedom, if we lose what we have, what our, you know, what our forefather, they, they, they built for us. Mm -hmm. I have times that I feel a little bit depressed because where do I go? Well, I did have hope when I was in Romania that I would make it here or some other countries as good as Canada, but now I don't see myself. I don't know where I'm going to go. If what we have today, it will become what I had when I was in Romania when I came from and and that terrified me sometimes not necessarily for myself but as much for my daughter and for our kids what what can she do if she loses the opportunities that I even have as an older person coming in here right mm -hmm. forget about if I would be here as a young born and raised in here right so it terrifies me sometimes that losing that freedom or what we have in here um, to me it's where do we go? And, and that's that's my final question, because part of our research into this has been asking people that came from communist and socialist countries, is there anything that concerns them 
in your case, you, um, yeah. about, about things that you're seeing in this country, any policies maybe that we're proceeding with that kind of make you wonder about, hey, this reminds me of what I escaped yeah. and left. Is, and I, I think you had said that you were concerned about some of the uh, infringements on freedom of speech. Is yes. That, what, what, what are so, you noticing that concerns you? Well, it concerns me because I think in a society as Canada, as I know it when I came here, you know, 27 years ago, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't scared to say anything. My, my ideas weren't censored in any way. I could say what I think. Mm -hmm. As long as I am respectful and I am not, you know, uh, doing anything unlawful. We have laws to protect people for, you know, for being uh, harassed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But when you start controlling the narrative, mm -hmm. even though you think it's the right way, your way, that's, it's already a bad, you know, a path you're going on because that's how the communists they try to that that's how they become those country communists by controlling the narrative by destroying our history by falsifying the history by not letting you talk about something so when you start controlling what's even like they said we have to control what's on the internet no mm. because let me choose i am i am old educated, I can make the research, I can use my brain, I got a critical thinking. I don't need somebody to censor what I'm looking at. This is my job. So once we start controlling the narrative, we can go very wrong, even though they try to tell us it's on our own interest, it's not. Mm -hmm. We cannot allow that because Romania wasn't a communist country from the very beginning. It slowly became until it was a very bad dictatorship. But they took it slowly by taking our history away, by saying this is the way it is, not mm. right. So censor were controlling yeah. any kind of of information. To me, it's very dangerous because who is controlling it, and what do they think? What about they controlling in their own ideas? So then we're going to end up with the control society eventually, because you can tell the kids what they need to read. You can tell the kids what they need to hear so it's very dangerous if you know in my opinion so when you think about the, the country that you left your knowledge about other countries that were have similar structures whether they're socialist yeah. communists, what what is your message to young people because they don't often hear these this is one of the reasons why we're doing this series is they don't often hear from people that lived under socialist to communist countries so what's what's your message to them well, my message to them is that if they don't have access to that information for whatever reason, ask people like me. There are so many people, ask their grandparents where they live. We still have people, they fought the war for our freedom, right? We have people that they live under the uh, Nazi Germany. We have, to, we have to have the dialogue. We have to talk. We have to teach them. It's our responsibility for our kids to mm -hmm. grow in a free society. We cannot let our kids not have access to what history taught us until here. Mm -hmm. So I know the kids, they're thinking because they have such a good life in here and they think we already in a way, Canada, it is a social country, not a socialist country because we provide for people that they don't have. We pay high taxes that we can pay for some people that they cannot have you know, a job for a period of time. We have a social system that works. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to go socialism. We don't want limited people because opportunities for people and competition creates the best of us. When we're in Romania and everybody had to do the same thing, we're miserable mm -hmm. because you have, you go to work, you get some money, that's what you can eat, that's what you can buy. So what's the joy in that? I love to work more. I have to, you know. Uh, maybe not buy another car, but buy a good car if I want. My, what I like to do is travel if I have money to see other places, other cultures. So we all different. So the children that they grow up today and they think socialism is good, it's not good because we all so different. We cannot all have the same pay. We cannot all have the same uh, dreams because that's who we are, a human. We all so different. So encouraging people to be entrepreneurs, to be the best of themselves. Um, that's not socialism. Socialism making everybody, you know, same income, 
same you know desire same information that's why eastern european countries they were as good as united states or canada or france because our society was not good we all the same here everybody if somebody's smarter than me harder worker that guy will provide even better for the society because he might give me work or somebody else over there the communist party give me a job i gotta be good i gotta be you know listening to all the rules uh i have to praise them that's not a life, that's slavery, if you ask me, right? So um, socialism is not good. Social countries, it is good. And that's what we are here. We provide for, you know, the unfortunate people. We provide for people that they don't have. That's why we donate to charities, right? I if think I'm we... in a communist country, I can't donate to any charity because I can barely have for my family, right? So... There's, I think there's a big difference between having social welfare programs like Canada has with healthcare and education versus socialist countries like what you're describing, where you've got the government controlling things and it, I, you know, I think it comes back to that, that word that you used it towards the beginning and that is choice, having that choice the right. Yes, I am using social because I do believe in my personal opinion. Yeah. A lot of the children here or young generation, they think socialism and social is the same thing. It's yeah. not the same thing. No. It's, it's, it's a big difference. I think you're right. And I, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with us oh. and uh, share your, your personal experience. And like I say, we're going to continue to talk with people from different countries to get those experiences. So I'm, I really appreciate you telling us a little bit about what life was like in uh, Romania. I appreciate that you asked me and I hope my experience help other people. And I sure hope that this country and all the other countries, they'll never lose this freedom. It's, um, it's probably the most precious thing we have, freedom. If we have that, we can achieve everything else. And thank you so much for your time and thank you for uh, having me. Well, thank you very much for Eureka and uh, we'll, we'll chat with you later. Bye Colin, thank you.